Hey students, um, today I'm going to be talking to you a little bit about um, these twin concepts of voice in, of innocence and voice of experience, which are absolutely essential in order um, to be able to manage the show and tell balance that you need to be able to um, to employ in uh, creative nonfiction, uh, which is the genre that your memoir essay is in. Um, so basically, uh, I, what I like to do with this is to start really simple and then complicate. Um, and uh, it may be that that even the it, having a simple grasp of this, as long as you execute it well, will be enough. But it is uh, good to have at your disposal some sort of more complex ideas about how this works. Fundamental to the concepts of um, of uh, voice of innocence and voice of experience is the very basic concept of show and tell that is um, that is inherent to creative nonfiction. Um, they, we talk about scene and commentary, and for the most part, when we're talking about creative writing, um, if we were to talk about fiction or poetry, we would say, um, although I disagree with this with poetry and somewhat with fiction, that you should show, don't tell. Um, and um, and it's good advice generally because uh, good creative work is largely image based and doesn't try to be too pushy with the reader about telling a reader how to feel. However, um, to say that uh, ideas should spring from images, that ideas should start with things and with people, is not to say that you should that a work should be absent of ideas. And a lot of what's interesting and compelling about creative nonfiction are the ideas because what we're trying to do in creative nonfiction is dramatize, to actually perform um, how the human mind works, to, to not only tell a story, but to talk about how a story affects us um, moving forward in time and how we process um, the things that happen to us, how we're constantly um, working things over and, ago, over and over again in our minds to try to understand our experience. Um, so the voice of innocence and voice of experience is a, a sort of the next step in thinking about show and tell, which, are, which is, okay, what kind of telling are we talking about? Um, the voice of innocence, one way to think of it very simply is that the voice of innocence is the narration. It's what happened. Um, now, the problem with that, of course, is while something is happening, while we remember an experience, we were in real time processing it, maybe not very well, and maybe not in a very sophisticated way, but even at eight years old, if you're, if you're experiencing something like a traumatic event or even just a simple one, a butterfly lands on your hand, um, you are not just a, a instrument or a, a, a prop within a narrative sequence, you are a human being processing the experience. So at eight years old, you have a mind, you have a brain and it's functioning and it's interacting and it's trying to make sense of something. Um, but it's still, even that processing in the moment is part of the story. It is the voice of innocence that is experiencing something as it happens and doesn't really understand what's happening. Then there's this other voice of experience, which we don't even always recognize or credit that's happening at the, as we think back about something and we try to understand its significance. And I talk a lot about essays are always about value inherently. They're saying this matters and this is why it matters. So we're always making an argument for significance. All right, so I'm gonna really show you a, a super simple example of this. Now the audio is gonna be lousy, so I apologize for that, but I'm gonna share a screen, um, a moment from a show that uh, my son used to like when he was very little, and actually is before my son's time. It's called The Wonder Years. Hopefully it'll come up here. And uh, again, the, the, the audio is gonna be lousy, but we're just gonna watch a five minute clip from The Wonder Years. Um, if you don't know The Wonder Years, um, The Wonder Years is about a kid named Kevin um, growing up in the 1950s, late 50s, I think actually 60s, sorry. And he's trying, he's trying to sort of navigate, navigate the world while it's changing. It's definitely the 60s because um, the, the, the uh, Vietnam War starts to happen. And he, it's about him growing up through time, but it's really about the adult Kevin thinking back on his childhood and trying to make sense of his experience in, in now. And of course, what, 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 uh, what a moment meant while he was experiencing it, of course, means something different to him looking back on it. And you very clearly have the voice of innocence 
um, and the voice of experience. And so uh, let's just watch this and, and see how it goes. June in the suburbs, nothing like it. Lawn mowers mowing, kids being kids, moving vans moving. I was starting to develop a complex about summer vacations. You gotta be kidding me. Kidding you? This is what I'm wearing. That? Well, give me a break. I'm wearing a dress. It's a statement. I'm gonna check the cellar. Well, at least everything was normal around my house. As for the rest of the neighborhood, it was definitely going downhill. Don't worry. I'm sure she'll send you a postcard. I'm going for a walk. She looked small and lost, like a little girl sitting in a moving van, which I guess she was. Can I come in? I guess so. Can I see it? Oh, I can't stay. I've got Karen's graduation. I've been planning what to say for about two weeks. About life. About love. So what'd you get in English? Just asking. Where are they? They're packing up my stuff. My brother's stuff too. The pudding is in storage. I think this is going to be good for my mom and dad. Yeah, I think so too. Winnie, where are you? So I'll probably see you around. But somehow I knew I wouldn't. And not just because of a few miles or a new school. It was because Things could never be the same. These lawns, these streets, this place. Winnie Cooper was leaving, leaving her home, leaving her past. Leaving. moving van pulled away. I didn't want to be. I was with my family. Which was changing too. Look at that. Things were going to be different now. My sister would be off to college. My brother was... My brother... My mom and dad would stay behind to fight the battle of dry rot and crabgrass and growing older together. As for me, well, 
I had my own distances to cover. Four miles, New York to Paris. The thing is, until when he left, everything in the world was outside my front door. But now, maybe the world would have to get a little bigger. Okay, well, so obviously, I'm not really sure how much analysis that really requires, other than um, it's a, an incredibly sweet moment that that deals with um, the narrative, the narrative that she, that he experienced, and the way he processed at the time, and thinking a lot about what he didn't know and didn't understand in terms of what he was going through, and what he also understood but didn't have words for. Um, and that's a lot of what we do in creative nonfiction is trying to understand our experiences and trying to process them. Now, um, I'm gonna share screen um, something else that tries to talk about, uh, so that's really like literally voice of innocence, childhood experience, the voice of experience, the adult looking back. Of course, it's a little bit more complicated than, than that. And I'm gonna take a look um, now at, um, at how that gets a little bit more complicated. Um, by looking at uh, what was originally taken from a craft essay in brevity.com by a really fantastic writer called Sue, named Sue William Silverman. Um, so we're going to take a look at that if I can find it here. It's always an interesting thing to try to find the, um, the uh, yeah, there we go, the voice of innocence. There it is. Okay, I'm, I'm going to try to make this a little bit larger for you. Um, and uh, hopefully you can still see it. All right, so Sue William Silverman, who's written about this extensively, um, says that the voice of innocence is, um, is, re relates the facts of experience to surface, surface subject. It's the voice that in effect says, first this happened, then this happened, and then this other thing happened. It reveals the sequence of events, particulars of your experience, whether in one page essay or a full length book. It's the innocent you, who you were when the events actually occurred. And she talks about her own narrative, um, uh, which was of sexual molestation when she was a kid there and, and the trying to remember what she remembered from those moments. The voice of experience is then twined to this voice of innocence, thus adding a more mature author persona. The second narrator establishes the progression of thought in creative nonfiction, allowing the reader to know what the voice of innocence, to know what the voice of innocence, what the facts mean. Um, by use of irony and metaphor, it interprets the surface subject. This voice in effect reflects back on the story, the past, and guides the reader through the maze of experience. In Terra Father, a simply, simplified example of a voice of experience sentence could be, because my father misloved me, I had no sense of my true self growing up, no language to understand what happened to me. This reflective narrator would then proceed to develop this idea of identity and language into a metaphor and theme for the entire memoir. Um, she also goes on to talk a little bit about her second memoir, Love Sick, um, on a woman's journey through sexual addiction, and talks a little bit more about this idea of how um, you can use, utilize both voices in the same line. And so here's an example that util utilizes both voices, where I, college freshman, describe my feelings toward a scarf given to me by my older married lover. I press the scarf against my nose and mouth. I take a deep breath. The scent is of him, leaves smoldering in autumn dusk. And I believe it is a scent I have always craved, one I will always want. I don't understand why the scent of the scarf seems more knowable, more tangible than the rest of him. So that's where things get kind of interesting is because here you're dealing with someone who has a much greater processing capacity in the moment of the, um, of the narrative. So now the writer must contend with both the imagery, which is very powerful there, um, how she was processing it at the time, which was complicated, but maybe a little less complicated and self-aware than the narrator is now. And so both of those are being layered into the narrative. Um, now, of course, <laughs> both of these experiences are about trauma and um, 
And White Horse also deals with um, narratives of sexual trauma. I started with something very simple in terms of childhood experiences and, and, and relatively innocent to talk about innocence and then went into more difficult territory. Um, because, of course, traumatic events in some ways are more difficult for us to process. That's why they're called trauma. Um, simply having a negative experience is not necessarily a traumatic experience. Trauma what makes an experience traumatic is that it keeps coming back after the event has happened in other ways. Um, so it, it, the, the, um, so it, it, it's, it, part of it is because we haven't been able to process it. Part of it is because our defenses have prevented us from being able to fully deal with it. Um, and part of it is just some events leave scars and we must work through those scars. Um, creative nonfiction can be a, a really fantastic place to work through those. I would never say that, the, that writing is inherently, um, should be used only as therapy. I'm a creative writer, this is what I do. Um, but I think that it can have an incredible therapeutic effect. Um, so you can both get some therapeutic value from writing while at the same time um, creating great art, um, if you hold yourself to it. And what I would say about therapy, about this processing of experience, is that um, telling the story, and then not just telling the story, but telling the story, and then actually processing it, examining and exploring it, are really good ways to asking the hard questions like, how did I get myself in this situation? Um, you know, am I responsible? Who is responsible? Am I a victim? Am I, uh, you know, it, you know, what, what could I have done differently? Um, but also coming to that realization, especially with most traumatic experiences, that one is um, not responsible and yet um, one can understand an experience better and then therefore it helped yourself to move forward. This is all taking possession of the narrative. So just like creating a piece of artwork, you can um, take this thing that's inside of you and that's been traumatizing you, create it, put it out there, and then sort of as if it were a sculpture, tinker with it, um, change it, uh, mold it, shape it, walk around it six times, you know, tinker it again, walk out of the room and leave it there behind you. Once you put it out into the world, it becomes something that you've created and that you've taken or some mastery of. And so this can be potentially a really good medium for people who are dealing with difficult subject matter. Now, one piece that we, um, that we did look at um, this week that, that is very difficult um, is White Horse. And this, um, this one by Goldbach is, um, is very uh, explicit in dealing with um, sexual violence. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, except to note a couple of things that I found interesting in how this author even further complicates voice of innocence and voice of experience. Because of course you have the event that Elise has experienced, is, and has experienced in terms of um, this campus experience of, of sexual assault. Um, and we sort of get a second hand or uh, um, uh, a second person um, or, or uh, uh, you know, narration of it, as if it were a story being told. But then you have this really interesting thing happening underneath it, which are footnotes, which are placed in sort of interesting places throughout the piece that give the first-hand account of the narrator, both, not the narrator, of the person who had the experience, both as, um, uh, in sometimes in terms of first-hand experience, simply telling the story, and sometimes processing the story. And so this becomes an interplay between the narrative, the text, and the footnotes, and you almost have competing or complementary, sometimes competing, sometimes complementary voices of innocence of experience going on at the same time throughout the piece. Um, so there are various ways that one can insert commentary into a text, and footnoting is certainly one of them, and it's a really interesting way of adding context to the story of an experience. Um, like I said, I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable reading through this um, uh, simply because uh, I don't know what the various sensitivities of people in the class are to this particular material. But what I will say is that the various levels of, of uh, commentary here are, are really sophisticated. One thing that she does as well is she um, is the author, Goldbach, incorporates multiple narratives. 
as a way of achieving a kind of meta commentary. So thinking back to radical juxtaposition, that idea, you put one thing next to another thing, you know, coffee cup next to cell phone, you create a third thing. Um, when you put two things together that normally don't go together, we as human beings try to um, look at similarities and differences. And then this thing happens in between this liminal space where we create meaning. Maybe that wasn't the best example, but um, here we have multiple things. There's a story, there's the anecdote about the white horse and logic. There's the story um, about Elise as a young girl being looked at in a strange way by this man. And you have the, the story of the assault and all of these things are working together. And um, they create this meta commentary. Um, the point of the white horse narrative being to get us thinking about the difference of difference between being a victim and um, and being a person. That uh, what happens when we say someone is something else? Um, what happens to identity? And um, and sometimes we confuse predication with identity. So we say someone is a victim of sexual assault and that therefore becomes their entire identity and this is a person trying to learn to not confuse predication with identity that um that the, that the is isn't necessarily an equal sign um and so that becomes this meta layer of commentary that, that gets sort of addressed, but is sort of hovering throughout the piece and keeps coming back. Also, we've got the voice of narration, which is very much kind of a voice of innocence, even though it's not telling the story of innocence. And then this voice of experience coming in through the footnotes, commenting on the um, experience in real time. Very complicated. You don't have to get that complicated, but it does show how much energy you can create in a narrative by incorporating um, different levels and layers of scene and commentary of showing and telling. Okay, I hope that this was helpful and got you thinking about ways of, of incorporating complicated commentary in your work. Um, please remember that uh, we have the memoir essay coming up soon. Uh, please uh, make sure that you're keeping up with the assignments. Uh, at this point, you should have completed two um, uh, uh, sorry, at this point you should have completed two uh, class journals and one reading reaction. I think I have responded to almost all the, well, all the class journals for the first one and um, almost all of the um, reading reactions. I will not be responding to every um, class journal. Um, some of these I will spot check and, the, and really this is just an up or down. A class journal, you either did it or you didn't. Um, one thing that I've been getting asked is, can you use your class journal and your reading reactions as the fodder or the basis for your um, major projects? Absolutely, that's why we're doing it. Um, it's not busy work. It's, it's mostly designed to get you thinking about writing. Um, they are practices and they may not yield um, work that, that, that will ultimately be um, used for your major assignments, but they, they can and ideally they will, um, or at least one of them will trigger it. Um, I hope you're doing well. Um, we are coming up soon on our first uh, Zoom workshops, and I'll actually get to see your faces soon, and I'm really looking forward to it, and all of your quarantine haircuts, like mine. Rich did that one. Um, she, poor girl, having to deal with my colleagues. But anyway, I hope you're all well and safe and, um, and keeping your spirits up, and uh, we'll all see the other side of this soon. All right, bye-bye.